It's time for HMS Inconstant, which is a bit of an interesting name to go for. Let's be honest, Inconstant. That doesn't sound really sort of Royal Navalish because, well, if anyone's constant, it's the Royal Navy. But, mm hmm. HMS Inconstant, it is. And here is one of the interesting things about Inconstant. She's actually succeeded by a certain vessel which I've already discussed in this series. HMS Shah. So Inconstant is Shah's predecessor. She comes into existence in 1868. She's an unarmored, iron-hulled, screw frigate. So, she doesn't have armor, but she does have a fairly substantial hull. So, you know, the Royal Navy, when she comes into service, don't feel her completely unprotected. I'm not sure about the names she has achieved later in life in in 1906, she's renamed, uh, renamed Impregnable II. One wonders whether that's because Impregnable I was proved to be very much pregnable. I don't know. Uh, then there's Defiance IV, and uh, in January 1922, and apparently Defiance II in December 1930. This is after, of course, she'd been hulked in 1897 and classified as a training ship in June 1906, when she's renamed to Impregnable II. She's finally broken up in Belgium in April 1956, after being sold for scrap in 1955. This is the ship I'm talking about. The, if... You sit there and you use the law of grandparents. A ship which had been around since 1868 should have, in 1955, qualified for some sort of special treatment. This is my one sort of disagreement with that as a theory. It doesn't really work because, as a rule... It's only more recently, and I'm talking since roughly the 60s, that there has really been a major preservation movement to build upon. Yes, Victory and others did survive for quite a while, but Inconstant is not a ship without a career. She was intended as the first of six fast, unarmoured frigates. Designed by the chief instructor of the Royal Navy at the Times, Edward Reed. They were being built in response to the fast, wooden American Wampanoag-class frigates. Only three were built. Why? Because, well, the American ships proved to be <coughs> so beautifully uh, flawed just so good enough that um, the British didn't really feel threatened anymore so um, they decided that these ships were too expensive and so they stopped building after free it happens it happens uh, she's powered by John Penn and Sons two-pit-cylinder trunk steam engine, which is always a fun thing to fit on a ship. And um, this all drove a 23-foot diameter, that's a 7-meter diameter, propeller. Yeah, this ship is interesting. So, here are her stats and vitals. Tonnage, 4,066 tons burfen. Yep. 
Grafen. Displacement. 5,875 tons, or 5,082 long tons. Length, uh, 337 feet 4 inches between the perpendiculars, or that's 102.8 meters. Beam, 50 foot and 4 inches, or 15.3 meters. Draft, 25 foot 6 inches, or 7.8 meters. 11 boilers were needed to supply the single trunk steam engine. This is why she has two funnels. She has 11 boilers. And they combined with this single trunk steam engine gave it the astounding figure of 7,360 indicated horsepower. It's a ship. It's just... This is the trouble. I, I, I've spent most of my day talking about and writing about things which measure horsepower in tens, if not hundreds of thousands. And then reading something 7,000 in 360 indicated horsepower. You're just sitting there going, could it even move? Well, apparently it could, because as well as having the ship rig sail plan, not the bark, the ship rig sail plan, the full sail plan, uh, she had a speed of 16 knots and a range of 2,780 nautical miles at 10 knots. Now, I'm presuming the range is the range of her using up her fuel, coal, for engines, because a sail ship doesn't really have a limiting of range. But the fact is, some of the books where I read these stats don't make it clear, and those stats are, to an extent, an aggregate of three different sources. Which is always fun when you're putting it together. Complement, 600. Armament, 10. RML, 9-inch guns. And 6 RML, 7-inch guns. Now, the 9-inch... 12 ton guns are really quite cool. Uh, you can find one that's in firing condition in Simon's Town. In South Africa. So if anyone's watching from South Africa, you can go and find one. Uh, there's also a Mark III gun um, at the Hearst of the Castle. Which would fit roughly with the period of this being launched. The 7 inch guns, well, they were sort of more something that the Royal Navy particularly liked, the 7 inch guns. Capable of, well, firing a shell of between 112 to 115 pounds. Uh, they could fire Palliser shells or common shrapnel. Or common. Time to trust. And if we remember the previous video in this series, the introduction to protected, unprotected, and armored cruisers, well, you will have seen some diagrams of Palliser shells were up there when I was talking about shells. They have an effective firing range of the 7-inch of roughly 5,000 yards. An effective firing range. And that's really their maximum range. And the 9-inch is roughly 9,000 yards. Again, their official figures are slightly bigger there, or what their maximum range is, but there's a difference between their maximum range and their maximum effective range. It's a bit shorter. But still, good guns. Useful to have. Always nice to have different guns. Her career was rather interesting for a ship which is, well, let's be honest, is built as some sort of response to American ships which turn out to be terrible, so hey, we've built a good ship. 
but it's expensive. Yeah. It's not got not getting any armor. Oh. And if we consider the guns, the nine inch guns were on a sort of the main deck in the traditional broadside layout. And they were rated with the ability to penetrate 11.3 inches of wrought iron armor. The 7 inch guns are mounted on the upper deck, two guns at the bow's chase guns, and they could pierce 7.7 .7 inches of armor. But she herself has no armor. So you have armor piercing guns, but you have no armor. She's built at Pembroke Dockyard in Wales. She's launched by Lady Muriel Campbell, daughter of John Campbell, the second Earl of Cawdor, who was a prominent British politician at the time. She then transfers to Portsmouth Dockyard for fitting out and finishing, and is commissioned in August 1869 by Captain Elston Doyle Darwin Alfin for duty with the Channel Squadron which is a prestigious posting. Not quite as prestigious as the Mediterranean fleet, but still a prestigious posting. He's relieved in post by Captain Charles Waddleove in September 1870, and the next year the ship is assigned to the Tatch Squadron, which is commanded by Rear Admiral Frederick Seymour. This squadron goes to visit ports in Scandinavia, and then arrives in Spithead in 1871. Ship is paid off in 1872 and spends next eight years in reserve. So this is not unusual in the Royal Navy in this period. It's kind of a contrast to the modern day. You know you need warships in wartime. You know you need a lot more warships in wartime than you need in peacetime. So what do you do? Well, we run them around and then go off. Stick them in a nice place decommission them, make sure they stay there and they're looked after, maintain them, care for them, and then get them out when you need them. In 1880, she's recommissioned. So she's re commissioned first in 1869. She'd been laid down in 1866. So we would normally stretch her date of birth to when she's launched, which is 1868. So according to that, 1868, she's been in service for 12 years, but eight of those years, she's been in reserve doing nothing. See, she's recommissioned by Captain Lord Walter Kerr, and this time she serves as the flagship for Vice Admiral Seymour of the Mediterranean Fleet. So yes, Frederick Seymour has remembered Inconstant. He liked Inconstant. He's going to command Mediterranean Fleet, which is the most prestigious posting you have at the time. And yes, he has requested Inconstant. So from August 1880 to October 1882, she is wandering around. She's also, at this point, assigned to the detached squadron, this time as the flagship of Rear Admiral Richard Meade, the fourth Earl of Clan William. When he gets sick in Hong Kong and is replaced in 1881, he's Sir Francis Sullivan, who replaces him, continues on at the using in constant as his flagship. And remember, the detached squadron is the squadron which the Royal Navy is using for going around the world and going. Hello, so you haven't listened to the local naval authorities. You see this amount of firepower turning up on your doorstep. Do you want to pay attention now, or do you, shall we start firing somewhere? In Compton's captain this time was a guy called Captain Charles Penrose Fitzgerald. And... They let the detached squadron all actually left Spithead on in October 1880. The mission being to circumnavigate the world. They wouldn't return till 1882. 
Prince George of Wales at the time, later King George V of the UK, uh, was a boarding constant between Melbourne and Sydney, and is said to have sighted a phantom ship. Unfortunately, this particular phantom ship was also apparently spotted by Tumalina and Cleopatra, so it might not have been so phantom, might just have been a uh, merchant vessel in the wrong place at the wrong time. They reached the Falkland Islands and then were ordered to Simonstown, South Africa, for possible service in the First Boer War, but hostilities had already ended by the time that they arrived. On the return voyage, in constant caught fire, but that was stopped by flooding all the other after co uh, compartments. And then the squadron was diverted to Egypt, where they took part in the Anglo-Egyptian War and, of course, bombardment of Alexandria, as pictured. Some of the Constance crew even landing to participate in operations ashore. She is reduced to reserve again on their return in 1882, uh, becomes an accommodation ship for the overflow from the barracks at Devonport in 1897, taken out of service in 1904, becoming a gunnery training ship in 1906, assigned to the boys' training establishment, impregnable, and is renamed... Various versions of Impregnable in 1907, then Defiance in January 1922, when she's transferred to Torpedo Training School at Plymouth, which is, of course, Defiance. And, as mentioned, sold for scrap and ends up going to the Breakers Yard in Belgium. She was, at that point, the second to last Welsh-built naval vessel afloat when she was broken up. Second to last. So. What's her purpose? Well, when she's first launched, she's considered one of the fastest ships in the world. Had 16 knots. In fact, some claim that she was the fastest in the world. She reached 13 and a half knots under sail, which is claimed to be one of only two warships to ever reach the speed, that speed. Her propeller could be hoisted into the hull and her funnels lowered to reduce drag to improve her performance under sail. So she was very much still a sailing ship rather than a steel or iron warship. She's a useful vessel. Her iron hull was sheathed in two layers of three-inch thick oak. That was itself covered by a layer of copper. This was all done to reduce biofouling. And also probably helped her with being a good seaboat and a steady gun platform. She is a very capable warship. You can see that by the fact that Frederick Seymour, who is no slouch and is also very unlikely to tolerate having a, cra a bad ship, pulls her out of reserve, pulls her out of the uh, being sort of languishing there, doing nothing to be his flagship. And then she's sent off with a detached squadron. Which, again, is not a mean thing to have that happen. It shows how useful she is. It's also kind of appropriate because, let's be honest, if you're going to send an unarmoured cruiser anywhere, unarmoured ship anywhere, probably the attached squadron is the most sensible because she's going off sailing around the world far away from the other powers who have protected and armoured cruisers. I have ships which she can't fight. Or and also it sends her out into the open oceans where she has the ability to maneuver. Those are advantages. But I did promise that this video would not just be about inconstant. 
there's also HMS Sharp, which is technically the third of the class built. Technically. And I say technically because you have Raleigh as one of the other ones. Technically, it's in constant Raleigh and Shah. Now, in constant is built by Penrock Dockyard, Raleigh is built by Chatham Dockyard, and Shah is built by Portsmouth Dockyard. In constant gets her engines from John Penn and Son, Raleigh from Humphreys Tennant and Co., Shah from Ravenhill. In constant is laid down in 1866. Raleigh, 1871. Shah, 1870. In constant is launched in 1868. Raleigh, 1873. Shah, 1873. They're completed. In constant, 1869. Raleigh, 1874. Well, that's when they're first commissioned. And Shah, 1876. Now, there are some interesting details on costs. Brassies gives hull costs, machinery costs, and total costs, excluding armament. And this is from the 1887 manual. The total, excluding armament, is £213,000, roughly, for inconstant. £193,000 for Raleigh, and 235000 for Shah. Shah, though, is armed with two 9-inch rifle muzzle loading guns, RMLs, 16 7-inch rifle muzzle loading guns, RMLs, and eight 5-inch breech loading guns. She is in service for three years. In 1876, when she's deployed as flagship for the Royal Navy Pacific Squadron under Admiral de Horsey, relieving HMS Repulse, which had been out there. This is the vessel which, along with HMS Amethyst, a corvette, fights the Battle of Percosia. The two unarmored British ships have to keep clear from the Huskar's turreted guns. They have to keep clear so they don't get sunk themselves. And although Shah was considered at the time the fastest battleship then afloat, being capable of 16 knots on engine power, the smaller Huskar proved more maneuverable in the shallow waters. And Shah fires the first ever torpedo launch in anger. But it's missed. It misses, I said. She visits the Pitcairn Islands while she's a flagship. And in 1879, on her voyage home, she calls at St. Helena. Where she delivered news of the British defeat. Uh, well, de de received news. And live in more news about various operations in the Boer War, but received news of the defeat of his Landwana. She was diverted to carry troops, soldiers to Durban in South Africa, then formed part of the Royal Navy contingent that assisted in the Anglo Zulu War. Which was interesting, mostly it was providing large guns, especially for mobile firing trains. Then she returned to the UK. Some of her crew are paid off in 1879, and she, she's placed in the 4th Division of the Steam Reserve. But she's soon transferred to the North American West Indies Station, and she's sent to the Royal Navy Dockyard of Bermuda to provide accommodation. H.S. Malabar takes over the task in 1897. She's converted to Coal Storage Hulk in 1904, but the Hulk is sold in 1919 and it's wrecked in. There is an interesting dispute over what happened 
next. But we do know her mast survived. Being iron, they were deemed to be a lighter, more durable replacement for the wooden mast of Atreus Victory. And they were fitted to Drip Victory when she was dry docked in 1887. And they survived to the, the present day. Her stern plaque, which was a gift from the Shah of Persia, for whom she was named for, was restored in 1874 by HMS Malabar. That's the uh, naval base Bermuda. And is on display at St. George's Historical Society Museum in Mitchell House in St. George's Town, Bermuda. And there is a monument to the ship's crew in Victoria Park, Portsmouth. HMS Shah. The flagship which lost a battle. Man, what else we got to come out? Ooh, 2nd of September. Five ways to fix the fleets of World War II, 1939 to 1940. And I think when this goes live, I will probably be on armchair admirals. So what's the question going to be? Should it be about Inconstant? Should it be about Shah? Should it be about unarmored cruisers, protected cruisers, unprotected cruisers, or armored cruisers? What should be the point? It's an interesting time. It's an interesting question, and there is a lot of the political debate. There's going to be one of the videos in this series is going to be about the Leander class, and they are all about politics. Of the Leander class of 1882 are all about politics, and the 1888 opera, you know, naval exercises. So, what can I say? What's a good question? Well, I had one in mind, and I think I'm going to go with it. You are, please imagine yourself, the undisputed ruler of a minor nation in South America at this time. Let's say, not one of the big ones, Chile, Peru, Bolivia... Argentina or Brazil, let's say Colombia, Venezuela, in this period, in the 1870s, 1880s. And you have to figure out how to build, what, whether to build a navy, what form of navy to build, and how to build it. You have a choice. You can invest in your own infrastructure. You can try and become the Sweden of South America if you want. But how do you go about that? Where do you get the iron from? Where do you get all the other supplies from to need to do that? It'll be very interesting to hear. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Um, I'll be announcing the winners of the Patreon choices on the 2nd of September. So don't expect this to change anytime soon because I'm going to record these videos and then check the results. Thank you very much for watching. Take care.